Hello everyone and welcome to Cine 104. History of Motion Pictures 1945 to present. We are all the way up to class 12 working our way into and through the 1990s and into the 2000s and a lot of real interesting stuff is happening as we get closer and closer to the present day and I have to remind us that as we get closer to the present we start losing some of that perspective. We don't quite have distance that we can look back on very far. Now, 1990, yeah, 30 years or so ago, but as we get into the 2000s and closer, we don't quite have enough time to know where the really great movies are. Um, you know, if we go back all the way to uh, Citizen Kane or even Goodfellas, things like that, back 20, 30 years ago, but as we get close to the present, we don't quite have that perspective to know which of these movies are going to be great movies, but I would say we have a pretty good handle on who the great directors are. I'm not sure which one of Quentin Tarantino's films is going to be thought of as really his great work, his masterpiece, but I'm pretty sure that Quentin Tarantino himself is going to be considered one of the great directors. He's already in the textbooks, and so are the Coen brothers and, uh, and uh, Christopher Nolan and people like that. It's a little harder to tell which of their films is going to be thought of as a great film, but I think we're pretty safe in knowing which directors are going to be considered uh, historically as great directors. So let's dive in, meet some of these people, Quentin Tarantino today and a few others. Uh, in the next few classes. And one of the very last movements that we can see, uh, that is that we have enough time that we can look back on, is independent cinema. And this happened somewhere into the 1980s and early 1990s. And uh, a new batch of directors, not the live TV directors or the film school generation and some of these other uh, directors, but a new batch of directors that made films on their own got money. This is before uh, this is before crowdsourcing and things like that. But ran up their credit cards, borrowed money from rich friends, things like that, and got a film made. And then they took it to a film festival. Here we see the Sundance Film Festival, and this is probably the the. Uh, primary American film festival for independent cinema. And so you, you have your script and you get together with some actors and you're lucky enough to find some good actors and you, and you, uh, and you get your money and you make your movie and then what? Then what? Okay, how are you going to get the movie out there to the rest of the country and to the rest of the world? And so one of the paths outside of the studio system, this is outside of the studio system, is you enter your film in as many film festivals as you can. Uh, Sundance is a good one. There are some others around uh, around here. There's, the, there's a very famous one in the south of France, Cannes. Uh, this has been around since the 40s, and the, Toronto has a film festival, Telluride, and uh, New York, LA. There's film festivals all over Berlin, and you, you get the, get the uh, fee to pay, uh, the, en the entrance fee to pay for your film to be at the festival. Hopefully people like it. Maybe you win an audience award or a judge's award or something like that. But the main thing you're looking for, other than those awards, is you're hoping that a studio sees it and decides that they want to buy it from you and... Uh, and then market it and exhibit it and distribute it. Okay, that's the that's the really the big reason why you want to go to these film festivals. You want to get a distribution deal. And the way I think of these film festivals is the way that you can look at some uh, uh, sports. A lot of times, uh, professional scouts will go to high school basketball games or high school baseball games or football games or college scouts uh, also very likely and they are scouting for somebody to come to their school or come to their team they're looking for new raw young talent and 
That is the way I think of these film festivals. Studio people are sort of like those sporting scouts. They're looking for raw, new, young talent that maybe can catch the public's eye and maybe have a career, right? Maybe have a career. So you, you manage to get your film in a festival. It does well. People like it. A, a, a studio representative comes up and they want to buy your film from you. You, you manage to scrape together two or three or four million dollars, which is pretty low budget for a film. And very likely they are going to lose most of that money. You're going to, you're going to make a small profit. Three million dollar film. Maybe they'll give you three and a half, maybe four, something like that. And 99 times out of 100, that studio is going to lose all their money. It's a gamble, right? It's a gamble. And they are gamblers in Hollywood. But every once in a while, you might get a Blair Witch Project. You might get a Little Miss Sunshine. You might get a Napoleon Dynamite. You might get a film like that that's going to do very, very well and make tens of millions of dollars, if, if not maybe even $100 million, like Blair Witch Project. And so what about you? Well, you're not going to make much of anything on that, okay? You're, you're not going to make any of that, hardly any of that money. The studio is going way out on a limb. They generally lose, and every once in a while, they spin the roulette wheel, and they, they win big. And you're thinking, oh, gosh, that studio made $90 million off my movie, and what did I get? Well, what you're supposed to get, if you play it right, is a career. That's what you want, is you want to get a career. Now, yeah, you didn't get some of that money from your Blair Witch Project or something like that, but if you do it right, then you get a script and you get attached, and there's something the studio sees in you, and you and possibly your, your, uh, your screenwriter, if you didn't write it, maybe an actor, who knows, and that's what you're really aiming for, is a career, is a career. So... That happened to a number of uh, the directors that we talk about and have talked about. So let's meet some of them. I bring up uh, the film festivals right before we talk about Quentin Tarantino because that's the path that he took. He did some writing. He wrote, he wrote some scripts first. He very famously did not go to film school. He was kind of self-taught. Uh, again, everybody knows he worked in a video store in Torrance in the South Bay area, watched lots and lots of movies while he rented out VHS and uh, uh, videotapes and DVDs and things like that and uh, was sort of self-taught, managed to get Reservoir Dogs into some festivals, people saw it, Pulp Fiction, and off he went with his career. So, uh, he is coming out of this this new um, independent cinema uh, path, okay? Not not some of these other paths like like we talked about before with uh, with film school and 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 some of those other ones in the studio system. Uh, and so Tarantino's been around for a while. His big hit, Pulp Fiction, that's the one I still like to focus on, and that's the one that I have linked uh, to for uh, for this class and a very influential film, one of the very most influential films of all the 1990s, for sure. And that is because of his script. And it's a wonderful script. He, uh, he won the Oscar for it, he and, uh, and, the, and his co-writer, and he's won another Oscar since then. And he managed to insert lots of pop culture references uh, uh, floating through the film. And uh, at the at the uh, near the very beginning of the film, we see Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta, and they're talking about what seems to be really random stuff. Uh, Travolta's character is back from Europe. He, as we find out later, is uh, part of a gang of sorts. Not exactly the mafia, but he's definitely uh, an underworld sort. He's been off. In Europe for a while, uh, maybe on the lam, maybe doing business. He's a hitman, maybe killing people. Who knows? He's been in Paris and Amsterdam, and he is making random references about what do they call uh, a, a McDonald's quarter pounder in Europe? 
And what, they don't call it a quarter pounder? No, they don't know what quarter, you know, they're on the metric system. They don't know what a quarter pound is. And that starts off this wonderful conversation about quarter pounders. And then they start talking about uh, TV show pilots. And they start talking about foot massages and all sorts of stuff that seems very random. And it threads its way through the movie very nicely. We'll see in the, in the next scene when they go to an apartment and there's a, there's, apparently there's a deal that's gone wrong and they meet these young, look to be 20-something uh, type guys. Um, <clears throat> maybe they tried to run off on, their bo on the boss. Uh, who knows what, but they're in trouble. We, we really don't know. It's kind of it's interesting that we really don't know why uh, that there's trouble, but there is trouble. And the whole thing with the, uh, they happen to be having uh, uh, a meal, they're eating uh, hamburgers, and here comes quarter pounders, and massages, and all sorts of other stuff like that. And uh, the big guy's uh, wife, played by Uma Thurman, she was in a TV show pilot, so all this stuff comes threaded through the film, and very importantly, it doesn't stop the movie dead in its tracks. Anybody can write a scene about pop culture and who do you like better, uh, Superman or Spider-Man or Superman or Batman or Elvis or the Beatles or Captain Crunch or, you know, it's, it's easy to just make references to pop culture, but if you don't do it right, you stop your movie dead in its tracks. And now the audience is thinking about this funny, silly little conversation that your characters are having about pop culture. And you've got a movie. Uh, you've got a movie. You've got a plot. You've got to move things forward. And a lot of directors try to do Quentin Tarantino-style Tarantino pop culture, and a lot of them just did a really poor job of it. Uh, so it was a very influential film, Pulp Fiction, because of the pop culture and the references. And it's also very famously out of order. He cuts around. It's uh, non-linear, okay, non-linear. jumps around uh, in a period of about a little bit more than 24 hours or so. Maybe it's 30 hours or 35 hours, something like that, but not much more than a, a, day, and a, a day and a half. But we might be in the evening, in the morning, in the previous morning, and the next day, characters are shot and killed, and then in the next scene in the movie, they're alive again because we're, we're earlier in the day. So if you, pick, uh, if you pick Pulp Fiction to watch, you gotta put your phone away, don't scroll, concentrate, you'll get so lost, you'll get upset, you'll be angry, what happened now, you'll be winding it back, trying to figure out what happened. So if you decide that you want to do uh, Pulp Fiction, uh, you know, get everybody to be quiet, turn the lights out, whatever you have to do, uh, and, and try and follow it, because you will, because of its nonlinearity and the wonderful dialogue, too. You really need to pay attention to it. Okay, so that was uh, a few years ago. Uh, he's not the most productive. It might take two, three years between movies. Some people are much faster getting movies out, like uh, the Coen Brothers or, or Clint Eastwood, practically one a year. And uh, most of uh, Tarantino's films are of a kind. I'm pretty sure that every single one of them is R-rated. There's violence in all of them. Um, yeah, it's some, uh, yeah, violence, R-rated. Uh, he... Uh, started going back in time, uh, first off to World War II with Inglorious Bastards, and then back to the Civil War era with uh, Django Unchained, and then up to uh, around that same period, uh, the Old West for Hateful Eight, and then his most recent uh, film, Once Upon a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He's back to uh, back to not quite the present day, but back to the uh, Hollywood area where Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown and Kill Bill, where all those movies uh, took place and are set. So, uh, speaking of, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, his most recent film, uh, got a lot of, a lot of Oscar love. Uh, he's sort of being allowed into the, into the club, nominated for uh, Best Director, Best Film, and um, and Best Supporting Actor, uh, Brad Pitt did win uh, Best Supporting Actor, 
Um, I think that's the only Oscar the film won. It might have... No, actually, I think it won something for um, uh, set or costume design, I think. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, uh, wonderful film. Uh, really classic uh, Tarantino. It really is. Uh, and yes, it's got some, some violence in it uh, and so on. Uh, two uh, American stars there and not an action movie, and that is kind of rare. And I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. It is... Well, we could talk about it right now. It is not the sort of movie that they make anymore. Uh, uh, stars in a mid-budget movie, uh, not an action movie, not a superhero movie or a fantasy or anything like that, but also not a low-budget independent movie. Uh, this movie cost uh, 80 or $90 million, and they put a lot of work into it, uh, but it's, it's a drama for the most part. And a little bit of action kind of toward the end. And maybe sprinkled around a little bit. 1969, uh, the, the winter and spring and summer uh, that we know that the Manson family murders took place. That's because uh, Brad Pitt's character runs in to some of the girls of the Manson family. And we... Uh, those of us who know history are like, oh no, oh no, that's the Spawn Ranch. We know what the Spawn Ranch is. That's where, uh, that's where Charlie and the family resided and what's going to happen. So he kind of baits us a little bit with this, uh, with this Manson family stuff sort of lurking in the background. It's not really about uh, the murders and the Manson family and all that. It's more about Hollywood. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character is a an actor Brad Pitt's character is his stunt double, and uh, Leo's character was uh, the star of a Western TV show, uh, Bounty Law, and those were really big in the late 50s and into the early 60s. And now Hollywood is changing quite a bit. We're in the late 60s, and uh, we get uh, the anti-war and the hippies and all this, and fashion's changing, and, and the uh, production code goes out and the rating system comes in and our rating and all that stuff that we've already talked about. All that stuff is happening in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So a very enjoyable movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, track it down. It's out there now and uh, watch it uh, along with, really, along with Pulp Fiction and his, his other. If, if I were going to pick two, I, those would be the two that I would pick. And uh, kind of an ad here, uh, I guess, for a podcast. And uh, this podcast is called You Must Remember This, uh, uh, produced and written and narrated by Karina Longworth. And it is about the first hundred years of Hollywood. A lot of, a lot of it takes, uh, a lot of her episodes are around uh, the 1920s and 30s and 40s and so on. But she did a series on Charles Manson's Hollywood. Uh, I think eight or nine episodes, and Charlie had uh, quite a few, um, uh, qu quite a few run-ins with uh, with Hollywood people and all that. And so, if you're a little bit fuzzy on all that, if you're not really sure how all that went down, uh, check out her podcast, and you can get all caught up. So, okay, that's uh, an ad for a, a pretty good uh, podcast. I really love it. So in uh, in Pulp Fiction, there are, as I mentioned, lots of pop culture references. So let's talk about a couple of them. Uh, they're really kind of fun. They go by kind of fast. They really, they go by kind of fast. At one point, Samuel L. Jackson's character says, you, flock of seagulls, why don't you tell us where he's got the stuff hidden? Okay, so the guy lying on the sofa, you, flock of seagulls, well, they were a 1980s hair band, there they are, and the guy on the sofa, lying there on the sofa, uh, has uh, hair, big hair. So that was a real quick, almost a throwaway line. I thought, what the heck, I bet a lot of my students don't know Flock of Seagulls, so uh, now you do. Okay, that's the reference. Also, at the very beginning, there's the whole talk about uh, Amsterdam and things are just like here, but there's little differences. And he, uh, Travolta's character goes on to uh, tell Jackson's character about the, the differences and stuff in Amsterdam 
you can buy marijuana and it's legal and you can smoke it on the street. And so I was in Amsterdam uh, myself uh, just a few years later, not in the, not in the early 90s, but a, a few years uh, a few years ago. And I thought I'd do some uh, do my homework, get some pictures, bring them back to my students. There is Amsterdam. There's a coffee shop. They do have Starbucks in Amsterdam where they just sell coffee. But for some reason, cultural to, to the Dutch, uh, that's where legal marijuana can be bought. So if you find yourself on vacation, of course now it's legal here in California, not such a big deal. Uh, but the characters in the movie, they're, they're thinking, you know, boy, this is such a wonderful thing. Uh, here's another coffee shop, coffee shop Smoky. <laughs> okay. And I think in Amsterdam, it's mostly... Uh, full of tourists and, and so on. I don't know that the Dutch go to the big touristy uh, places. Uh, one of the other things they talk about, uh, McDonald's and, uh, and Quarter Pounders and all that kind of stuff. And so, yes, there is uh, the Paris McDonald's. And uh, he is saying, when he's talking about the little differences, that in, in McDonald's you can get a beer, and there's, there's the Heineken there on the menu. Uh, cappuccinos, all that kind of stuff at McDonald's, the wonderful cultural uh, similarities and differences. If you want to have fun, um, go to Google Images and search for McDonald's menus China, McDonald's menu Brazil, McDonald's menu India, because they're kind of like McDonald's and they're very uh, they're very uh, uh, specific to each country. So the whole idea of them selling uh, uh, beer and wine in Paris, uh, you, it's really expanded when you start looking at uh, what a McDonald's would look like in China or in India. Anyway, a little bit of fun there uh, for you. Uh, there is uh, the Royale with cheese, uh, cheddar fondue, and that would be the, uh, you know, the Big Macs and so on. And the other thing that they mention what do they put on their French fries in Amsterdam? Mayonnaise. And, and uh, they're, ew, they're saying in the, in the film. Um, so anyway, we're in Amsterdam. There we go. Uh, we have some Dutch friends, and we're visiting them and their daughters, and they had to order a big side of, big side of mayo. Seems kind of weird to us, but, you know, um, sometimes I think, a lot of people in America like baked potatoes, and what do they put on baked potatoes but sour cream? Sour cream and chives and bacon bits and stuff like that. And sour cream is just that egg, eggy, uh, um, fatty sort of stuff, just like mayo. Uh, a little bit different, but kind of the same. Uh, and uh, if you know what they put on French fries, in Canada, raise your hand so I can call on you, and the answer would be vinegar. Vinegar and salt on French fries in Canada. All right, so we're gonna stay overseas here for a little bit. Let's move over to Scotland. And we have Danny Boyle, British director, and he works in many genres. There are some directors like Quentin Tarantino who doesn't work in lots of genres, pretty much action uh, and so on a, a kind of western but for the most part uh, Tarantino movies are kind of uh, kind of alike uh, lots of dialogue and violence and, and shooting and blood and stuff like that but there are a few directors like Danny Boyle and Stanley Kubrick and some others who maybe do a comedy maybe a drama maybe sci-fi uh, and so on and uh, Danny is definitely uh, one of those directors and his film Train Spotting from back in the 90s. That's the one that really made him uh, uh, known. I was going to say made him a star. I don't know that directors are stars. There's a few, maybe Quentin, Quentin Tarantino's a star. There aren't too many star directors. Uh, but anyway, that's what uh, got Danny uh, into the public consciousness. And it uh, takes place in Scotland. They have very, very thick Scottish accents. I've linked to some scenes from Train Spotting. You might want to turn the titling on because their accents, yes, they're speaking English, but they are going to be hard to understand. Uh, so uh, think about that. 
Uh, here we have uh, Ewan McGregor. You might know Ewan McGregor, and we're going to see him coming up uh, today when we, uh, in about two movies or so. So uh, a completely different, uh, completely different look for Ewan. He's not, uh, he's not Obi-Wan, but he's in Moulin Rouge. So that was an early effort and speaking in his native Scottish brogue. Uh, again, kind of hard to understand. Uh, th there's a scene that we're going to see. Uh, they're, all, they're all drug addicts, and they like heroin. And he's very uh, honest about heroin. And, uh, and it's funny, and, and it's honest, and they're kind of in this together, and it's kind of sad and, uh, and dramatic and all that. Just like you'd expect from drugs. Drugs are inherently, I think, very dramatic if you're looking for subject matter for a, for a film um, you could do a lot worse than drugs drugs drug, drugs got a lot of built-in drama uh, right there uh, even self-degradation things like that and there is a scene where uh, Renton okay McGregor's character is going to be fishing around in the most awful toilet you've ever seen in your life and uh, you, you you know, you kind of want to gag. Uh, don't gag. Uh, it, when they filmed it in the movie, it was it was chocolate. Apparently, it smelled quite sweet in there. But of course, it's shot very realistically, and it looks like he's he's fishing around in the toilet in this awful, awful, awful toilet. And you might think, so what's the point? Why why are they doing that? And, you know, why would he put that really gross scene into the movie? And I would say. Uh, if we think about it a little bit, that he's making a point about drugs. Yeah, for your drugs, he's he's dropped, he's lost some drugs down in the toilet, and he wants them, and he will, he will, fish through shit to get his drugs, and that that's how far debased and degraded he is. So uh, yeah, he's not just putting it in to gross us out or anything like that. There's a real point behind that. What people will do sell your bodies, sell your bodies for sex, this and that and the other, uh, and do all sorts of awful things. And I think he makes a point quite well in that. So has got, got a little bit of fantasy element in there. He's not just trying to gross us out. There's, there's some fantasy element uh, in there. Um, all the, uh, years later, 20 years later, he does a sequel. Danny Boyle does a sequel. He directed it, wrote it. All these guys... Uh, and Gal are all back, and it's quite good. It's not, a, it's not quite the groundbreaking film that Trainspotting was, but uh, T2, Trainspotting 2, is uh, it's pretty good, and I feel like Trainspotting tracked that one down, and we get the rest of the story. A little bit more uplifting. So let's look at the big picture of Danny Boyle. Like I said, he, he has quite a, uh, a varied... Career. He does a little of this and a little of that, adventure and horror, zombie, sci-fi, uh, biopic on Steve Jobs, a romantic fantasy, uh, Yesterday, which is quite good. I just caught that recently, and it's quite good. And uh, Danny is uh, a great example of a director that I like, and I would watch anything that he does. It, it, I might think, oh boy, rock climbing, that doesn't sound very fun, or a bank hold up, or, or a, a, you know, a movie about uh, uh, a young Indian uh, boy, uh, te I guess youth, not maybe not boy, youth, uh, on the Indian version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I don't know how that, uh, how that sounds, but Danny Boyle is directing it, and, and uh, yeah, it's good. So I, I, I follow directors. And it's well. I've I've uh, usually been steered pretty pretty good on that. Uh, all these movies are really well worth it. And the, some of them, the only reason I saw them is because of Danny Boyle. All right, as promised, back to uh, Ewan McGregor. We're still touring the world. We have Baz Luhrmann. We're off to Australia this time. Baz does very revisionist kinds of movies, whether it's a, whether it's a Shakespeare movie of uh, Romeo and Juliet, or a dance movie, or a musical. Uh, his movies are often anachronistic, 
Uh, this movie, Moulin Rouge, is set in Paris in 1900, and yet the songs that they are singing are Elton John and the Beatles and Madonna and Nirvana. Okay, and uh, he does that again in, in uh, The Great Gatsby with uh, uh, music and uh, so on that is not of that time, and that makes it anachronistic, out of time. Moulin Rouge, 2001, it has a framing device, and the movie opens up, and our protagonist, played by Ewan McGregor, is very, very sad, and he's lost the love of his life. He's going through this in voiceover, and you might be thinking, oh gosh, do I really want to watch this? It looks like a real downer thing. And, and it's in black and white, and you're thinking, oh, I don't know. But it does a very interesting mood shift. It switches to color. It gets almost manic, and the colors get very bright, and the music gets very up-tempo. And within, like, the first three minutes of the movie, it's a completely different feeling than the opening, uh, the opening of the film. So <laughs> stick with it for at least five minutes, and you'll probably really enjoy it. It's really a lot of fun. It takes place in Paris. The Moulin Rouge, which means red windmill, or windmill of red, technically. Uh, and it's in Paris in a, in a sort of the hilly neighborhood, uh, a little on the outskirts, uh, called Montmartre. Uh, and uh, it was a real place. that They have a set in the film of this windmill where a number of key scenes take place. And so that would have been uh, down here when it was first built. Today, it's a big tourist attraction. We see lines of tourists uh, paying too much money to get in and buying overpriced drinks and all that sort of thing. Anyway, the Moulin Rouge, uh, real place. Paris, wonderful city. If you get a chance to go sometime in the future, definitely. And Romeo and Juliet has, uh, this is Romeo and Juliet, this is from The Great Gatsby, the picture with Leo there. Leo was also in Romeo and Juliet, playing Romeo, using the original Shakespeare language, uh, but it has a modern setting. It's very creative the way they, the way they do that. Um, and uh, they have guns instead of swords, but the language is, is kept to the original Shakespearean in a very creative way, I have to say. And... Um, that was the film that Leo made before uh, Titanic. Uh, and I think Titanic was maybe his next film, and that's the one that really made him the big star. But Romeo and Juliet uh, with Claire Danes as Juliet, really good movie. Maybe you saw it in high school. Uh, it seems like, uh, seems like Baz is a, uh, a, a great uh, high school uh, filmmaker, if, you, if you've got an English class and they need to get through Romeo and Juliet, Baz is there for you. And if you have a different English class, then he's got The Great Gatsby. Uh, and um, so there's a pretty good chance you got to see one of uh, Baz's other two earlier films in high school. And, um, and uh, if you did, I'm sure you'd enjoy The Other or Moulin Rouge. And I've linked to just the trailer for Great Gatsby, but it's a lot of fun. Next up is David Fincher. There he is, with Brad Pitt and Edward Norton, who were in the film that we're going to be talking about today, Fight Club from 1999. It, that's not an Oscar. He, it's some kind of an award. I'm not sure what, but he must have gotten some kind of an award. And he, uh, Fincher, uh, dark, dark lighting, downbeat, um, drama for sure, all of the dramas, uh, some um, uh, serial, two, where there, there's a, a serial killer, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, serial killer in Zodiac, and a serial killer in Seven. So there's that, okay, he's got three serial killer movies, uh, three films with Brad Pitt, um, and very interesting. I like his stuff a lot. Again, I might not have seen some of these movies, but being a David Fincher fan, I thought I'd, uh, check him out and I've never been disappointed. We are going to talk about Fight Club. Normally I would have a DVD to put in and 
show as much of it as I wanted, but I don't quite have that chance uh, online. And so I found most of the stuff that I would be showing in the classroom and I put it in the right order. And so if you watch them, I, I think the trailer's in there somewhere, maybe not, uh, but it, it does pretty much what I would have what I would have shown. And so there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on of the sort of thing that we talk about in this class. And we talk about framing devices and we talk about voiceover and stuff like that. So um, normally what I do is I play, uh, I jump around a little bit. It's not quite the first 20 minutes of the film. I have to jump around just a little bit. But then we would have a class discussion and I would ask people, um, what sorts of things did you see that we talk about in this class? So, after you've watched the uh, after you've watched the seven or eight clips that I've got for you, let me see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven clips that I've got for you. Then you can come back to this. So, if you stop the tape, if you stop this the, the tape, the video right now, go watch the Fight Club. Uh, links that I have for you and then come back then I would say what have you noticed okay and hopefully you will have noticed there's a framing device you will have noticed there's voiceover you will have noticed it has a nonlinear plot and you will have noticed that it breaks the fourth wall I told you there's a lot of stuff going on here uh, maybe you'll notice flash frames of the Brad Pitt character who is nameless in the film there's also text animations. There's a dream sequence. So I hope you noticed all that. And when you watch movies uh, for your papers, sometimes it might be a movie that you love and you've seen it a whole bunch of times and you would be able to really pick it apart. But sometimes you're going to be picking movies. Maybe you've never seen it before and you've heard about it. Everybody says you got to watch Goodfellas. Everybody says you got to watch Fight Club. Uh, everybody says you got to watch Pulp Fiction, and it's the first time that you're watching it. And all, all these movies, really, they 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 do, um, uh, they gain a lot on repeated viewings. They really do. They all gain a lot on repeated viewings. And Fight Club, for sure, you pick up a, an awful lot of stuff. This is one of those movies with a big twist at the end, and we're certainly not going to reveal it. Here, and I hope nobody has revealed it to you if you decide to watch it. Um, and so those kinds of movies with a big old, a big old uh, reveal twist thingy at the end uh, really gain a lot on, uh, on a second or third or fourth viewing. Um, Psycho is one of those movies too, right? Psycho is like that. The Sixth Sense is like that. Big, big twist uh, reveals and things uh, right toward the end. So you might think, well, what are the themes? And uh, out of those seven uh, clips, hopefully you would get uh, identity, certainly, and manhood uh, is another one, fight club, right? These guys, guys only, fighting, and so on. Uh, sleep uh, is another one. Edward Norton's character travels for his job. Uh, he's a, a, a car, an automobile recall investigator. So when there are car crashes and things like that, he goes and investigates and has to has to go through a, a formula to figure out if the car, uh, if the if the manufacturer needs to do a recall on that car. He uh, sleep is a real key to this movie. He's 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 uh, he loses. Uh, he, he doesn't sleep very well. It makes him kind of dingy. Sometimes he, he seems to wake up in places where he doesn't even remember going there. How did I get there? He's thinking. Consumerism is another part of it, right? Consumerism. And he uh, and the Brad Pitt character end up in uh, Brad Pitt's character's house. It looks like he's a squatter. Uh, it is a really rundown house. Uh, there's still electricity in there. Somehow there's electricity, but uh, when it rains, the, the water goes all the way through the house, and uh, the electricity shorts out, and, and it's, it's a 
just a real, a real awful place. And that's not by, that's not an accident. Okay. Uh, even architecture can have a metaphor. Uh, the, the house, uh, the rundown house, a metaphor for for the character. And sometimes when we fix up our house, we're sort of, um, metaphorically fixing ourselves up, uh, you know, getting our act together and getting in shape and cutting our hair and getting new clothes, all that kind of stuff. Only they're doing it with a house. So that's, that's, it doesn't happen all the time in movies, but um, certainly when somebody puts a lot of time into uh, um, uh, reconditioning a car or a house or something like that, it definitely has uh, uh, further meaning than, than that. And this house for sure. Okay, enjoy, enjoy uh, that. Uh, really fun movie. Um, and uh, if you do watch it uh, and you write a paper on it, then you will be doing uh, you'll be doing uh, the research, and you'll you'll find even some more stuff in there uh, that's that's quite interesting. Yeah, that that that's a key uh, movie. I know a lot of times you might see a movie and you might think, well, I don't need to do any research on that. It pretty much is there. But there are a lot of other movies that a little bit of research really opens it up and helps you understand it uh, even. Uh, uh, even more than uh, than you might have gotten just on your own, and I think that's where the research uh, really helps out. Next up is Clint Eastwood, <clears throat> and it's hard to figure out where to put him in. He's been making movies since the 1970s. He's been making movies since uh, Spielberg and and uh, uh, Scorsese and all those guys coming out of the 1970s. But he's still making movies today. The movies that he made that won Oscars were more into the 90s and 2000s, which is why I didn't put him in way back in the 70s or 80s. There he is as the man with no name in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, he, made, uh, he made that film in Europe. He was a TV actor. He, was a, he played a cowboy on, uh, on a TV show. Uh, very similar to Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So there's a nice link there. Clint Eastwood was also a uh, cowboy TV cowboy star uh, who managed to get a good film career going. Uh, it's hard to say if Leo's character is going to get a good film career going. Uh, but uh, Clint went off to Europe in the summertime between shooting of his television show, Rawhide, and made more westerns, uh, Fistful of Dollars, based on a, an Akira Kurosawa film, and uh, up for a few dollars more, and The Good, the Bad, the Ugly, just a really fantastic movie, ranks very, very high on, uh, on uh, film lists and internet movie database lists and all that. Clint didn't direct it though, but it did help make him a big international star, and uh, w with some of that leverage as a big star. He decided he wanted to do some directing. And uh, so he has directed 40 features in, uh, in 50 years. So that's pretty good clip. That's a pretty good clip. Uh, and like I say, I have likened him uh, to uh, the Coen brothers and Woody Allen and that they really crank them out. They win Oscars and uh, they uh, have their budgets quite low, quite low budgets. Clint is a very, uh, very fast and lean filmmaker. He comes in under budget, ahead of schedule, all of that. Studios love him. His movies don't make hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office. And some of them do pretty well. Uh, American Sniper did pretty well, but, um, but he, he, he has two directing Oscars and, um, and, uh, two Best Picture Oscar winners, so pretty good for Clint, for an old TV cowboy actor. The one that we will be looking at in class is uh, really his classic uh, Unforgiven. It is a Western. He, was, he also played Dirty Harry in a series of uh, cop movies, 
uh, make my day and things like that. So he, he, he played a cowboy. He's played cowboys and cops. Those are kind of the things that he's really mainly known for over the years. Uh, Unforgiven, wonderful movie, picture directing Oscars. And it, it really um, takes apart Westerns. It's uh, about fame and legend. And uh, one of the characters in the movie is a writer. And uh, Westerns were uh, uh, big um, books. They, they sold lots of books. Uh, dime Westerns, uh, they call them. And uh, sort of um, uh, quickies that people were writing in the 1880s and 1890s and 1900. And they were very, very popular. A lot of people back east, uh, Philadelphia, New York, and so on, wanted to read about these Western mythic heroes, sort of like the superheroes that we might have today with their superpowers and capes and all that kind of stuff. And Westerns were a really big uh, part uh, of, of that period. Uh, lots, of, um, uh, lots of films have been made about Westerns over the years in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. It's a really big genre. Uh, and Clint is one of the last of our Western stars, uh, along with John Wayne. Um, uh, Kevin Costner seems to kind of be uh, holding on to the, the whole Western. He's made a number of Westerns and does a pretty good job of it. Uh, but I can't really name too many other Western stars that have been in four, five, six Westerns. Seven, eight, nine. I don't know how many Clint's done, but um, Westerns have definitely fallen out of favor. Uh, but um, they really have all the, all the stuff that superhero movies have, right? The Oftentimes, the lone hero, uh, against all odds, all that sort of thing. His character in this movie, though, is not a very nice guy. Uh, he was a, a, a gunslinger, kind of a hired gun. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, he is retired, not doing a very good job as a farmer, not doing a very good job as a single parent. And meanwhile, uh, not sure, probably a couple of states away, in a, uh, in a small western town, a young prostitute makes a big mistake and laughs at one of her clients. He gets very angry and cuts her up. Doesn't kill her, but he cuts her up, and that's how she makes her money, in part, through her face. And the sheriff uh, doesn't do much about it. Mostly he tells the, the cowboy who cut up the poor girl to pay the saloon owner, because he's the one that's going to be out money. So the girl and her other uh, prostitute friends uh, all chip in money. They've saved their money. They all chip in and they put out a, uh, a, re uh, a bounty on that cowboy. Okay, sort of secretly, but they put out a bounty on, you know, we want justice. Clint Eastwood's character finds out about it. He's not very good as a as a farmer or uh, or as a parent, and so he and his friend, played by Morgan Freeman, go after the bounty, and they're going to run into the people in that town. So, um, yeah, I've linked to the ending shootout, and uh, it's very nicely done. It's really nicely done. After watching it, you might think, "Boy, I got to watch some more." Westerns. It's, it's just so well done. Clint Eastwood is a, primarily was an actor, is an actor. He's still with us. He's in his 80s. He's still directing. He's like, I don't know, 87 or 88. He's still directing. Um, I mean, he doesn't have to unload the truck or anything like that, but you still have to wake up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and get out to the set and, and so on. So that's, uh, that's something right there. But uh, actors who direct, and there is Clint Eastwood and Woody Allen, Charlie Chaplin, of course, way back. That's Warren Beatty there on the right. He didn't direct himself in Bonnie and Clyde, but we know him from Bonnie and Clyde, and he did win. Uh, I think everybody here, uh, Oscar for directing, Oscar for directing. I don't think they were doing Oscars when Chaplin was directing. He has an Oscar for directing. Redford does. Affleck does. George Clooney didn't win an Oscar for directing, but he's been nominated. Neither did Jodie Foster and Carl and his son Rob 
uh, have it. But these other actors, they've done really quite well. Um, and uh, I would say Rob, Rob Reiner has uh, quite a few. Um, this is Spinal Tap, and uh, but he's got a lot of pretty good movies under his belt, too. So another list, and, and that's a very partial list of actors who direct. And not just once or twice, but really making a career of it. So Clint Eastwood, low budget, critical acclaim, Woody Allen, Coen Brothers, there you go. I knew there was a slide in there somewhere that would make that point. You can now write it down officially. <laughs> I know if I'm just talking, maybe you're not writing stuff down. Uh, but there it is. It's, a, it's the magical PowerPoint slide. So that makes it uh, test worthy. Million Dollar Baby, about a female boxer, best picture and directing and actress. Oscars for Clint, Gran Torino, uh, Sudden Impact. That was one of the uh, uh, Dirty Harry uh, cop movies from back in the 70s and 80s, and then American Sniper, a uh, fairly recent film uh, that probably is his biggest moneymaker. It did quite well at the box office. I would say that's probably his biggest moneymaker. Here's a rarity, a female director. And it is hard. It's, uh, for some reason, it's a real boys club in directing. It's a very slow process. Women are finally getting a chance uh, to direct maybe a big budget movie. I mean, women have always been able to direct movies, but mostly they get told to direct Jane Austen movies and romantic comedies and, and you know, chick flicks. I hate to say that, chick flicks. Uh, but the real movies with the superheroes and cars and action and James Bond and all that stuff is too often left to the men. And that's where the big budgets are. And, of course, that's where the big paychecks would be. So uh, women are allowed to direct small budget movies. Of course, they're not going to be paid as much as men. And it's hard to break in to uh, the, the big budget stuff. Catherine Bigelow has managed... Uh, I wish I didn't have to put female director. It should be just, you know, she's a director, but we have so few female directors, African-American directors, Asian directors, that when one of them uh, makes the list and gets in our class, uh, I really feel obligated to call attention to it. Uh, and uh, hopefully, if I'm still teaching in this class in, in 10 years or, or so, it won't be such a thing, and I can, I can, take, I can take the female out or the African-American out for Spike Lee or, or that sort of thing. But right now, I think we really need to, to, to call attention. She uh, won the f first, female direct, first female director to direct a Best Picture and received the Best Directing Oscar. So she did break through that, uh, that uh, barrier. Hurt Locker uh, set in Iraq during the, uh, the recent Mideast War there, was the film. Very good movie. Check it out. Uh, I have a couple of nice links to it. Uh, you'll see she's, you know, really a good director. She deserved the Oscar. They weren't just giving it to her because they needed to, to give one to a female. She really earned it. It's, it's a really good job. Uh, also Zero Dark Thirty. Um, probably, probably her biggest hit. I would say that's her biggest hit would be Zero Dark Thirty about the the uh, tracking and investigation and capture and killing of Osama bin Laden. Near Dark, which is a pretty good modern-day vampire movie, you might like that, and Detroit set during the 1967, uh, I'm not sure if you want to call them uh, rioting or uprising or what, depends. A language is very powerful depending on what you want to call something like that. Anyway, it's set in Detroit with, we'll call it civil unrest. And our last director of the day is Steven Soderbergh, and he very definitely came through the independent film festival circuit, along with Quentin Tarantino and the Coen brothers and a bunch of other pretty good directors. There he is. He 
often shoots his own films. He is part of the Cinematographer Guild. I don't know if he edits or not, um, but I know that he likes to get behind the camera. And, uh, and he is another one of those directors that manages to do personal type movies and then uh, franchise type movies. So uh, Aaron Brockovich um, with uh, Oscar and picture nominations. Uh, Julia Roberts won her Best Actress Oscar for that film. Traffic uh, came out the same year, by the way. And, uh, and both of those movies were nominated for Best Picture. He won for Traffic, and he won his director Oscar for Traffic. Uh, he, he's sort of up against himself. Julia won for Aaron Brockovich, uh, but uh, Stephen won uh, his directing for Traffic. The Traffic is drug trafficking, and I mentioned uh, drugs are a real, uh, real source of drama, that's for sure, and this one takes a a big, wide view of uh, the problem. And we have four or five interlocking stories. One of the stories is set in Mexico. One of them is set in San Diego. One of them is set in Ohio with uh, uh, DEA people. And there's a, a, a drug lord's wife, uh, some high school kids, uh, a Mexican cop. Uh, so uh, it's a big, wide view of drug traffic and uh, and uh, Stephen directed it and picture and all those good things and I think I've got a couple of good scenes for you to watch in that uh, let's take a look at his other films there's the oceans movies those would be his franchise 11 12 and 13 with George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and everybody um, not Oscar type movies but those are the movies that pay for the nice house in Beverly Hills as they say. And then he's got his smaller uh, type movies, uh, Magic Mike and Side Effects and Logan Lucky, a real quirky film. He's done TV work, uh, an early proponent of digital cinema. And um, uh, one of his films from, I don't know, seven or eight years ago is, uh, all of a sudden it is one of the hottest movies around and that's Contagion. And I've linked to uh, that film, I think to the trailer, but you get a pretty good feeling for it because it is about a viral outbreak, a worldwide viral outbreak, uh, very scientifically accurate. They were very, very careful to do a lot of research. Um, and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, mortality rate in Contagion is much higher uh, than the, the uh, coronavirus uh, mortality rate. Coronavirus mortality rates uh, for the population as a whole is only about 2% or so. I hate to say only, lots of people are dying, but in contagion it's much more dramatic and much bigger and much higher. Um, I don't know, half the people that get it or 60 or 70% of the people that get it die. And um, But it's really a good film. Uh, Matt Damon's in it, Gwyneth Paltrow and uh, Kate Winslet, and uh, Jude Law. So sort of an all-star cast. And as I said, it's um, very current, that's for sure. It's very, very much in the headlines and very accurate. Uh, the, the Center for Disease Control and all those people, it's very, very accurate in how they work on, uh, work on the... Um, uh, works, work on the vaccine and, and uh, track it and trace it and all of that. So uh, you might think about that. Maybe it's too scary. Maybe you want to wait before you watch it, but uh, a really good movie. So there we go. That's it for today. Same 104, History of Motion Pictures. Up to the present, we're working our way through the 90s and into the 2000s. And that was class 12. We're going to do some international stuff coming up going off to uh, Brazil and uh, France and other other places, uh, foreign films for, for class 13. Until then, take care and see you then.